On today's video, I'm gonna show you how to make a scrap metal rose using scraps that we have in the shop. So to make the basic scrap metal rows, I'm going to show you a couple little things that we're going to be using, using scraps, uh, some basic layout tools, and the way that I teach this to younger students. Now you can follow along with the exact steps I use or do it your own way depending on the tools you have, but I'm going to show you based on the tools that we use in the shop today. Now depending on which material you have will change the way it looks, but really the steps are going to be the same. I've got a couple different samples here to show you what can be done, and really it's all personal preference for the final product. For the stem, we can use something thin like 8th inch solid round. I'm using steel because we're going to be doing some welding. Or for me, I have a lot of this material, I have a lot of 3 16th solid round. For the petals and stuff going on the top, I'm going to be using some thinner gauge material. There's not going to be any welding involved for this, just a lot of cutting, filing and bending. And I also have a lot of 16 gauge sheet metal. I don't really have much in between like that in the shop, but that's why we're using what we have. I'll be using the 16 gauge for things like adding on leaves or thorns to my flower. That's going to be welded on through the back and hidden. If you're not a great welder, you don't have to see it. On the internet, you can find templates for different stuff like these. These are from Instructables and I've made a few changes of them to work for the students in the class. We're not just going to be cutting these out with scissors and tracing them onto metal. We're actually going to be redrawing these at full scale. I've actually shrunk these down on purpose so that students have to try and learn how to use some of the measurement tools, how to use a compass, how to use a ruler, and how to do some basic sketching by looking at something and trying to make it look the same here. I'm going to run you through how I do that with the kids. So I just have a very simple kit. I picked this up at a local big box store, just a simple $5 geometry kit. I have a bunch of these and I show students how to actually draw circles with a compass. Insert your pencil, squeeze those together so the points align. We're going to start by drawing this one up here just because it's up in the top corner of this and I'm going to try to lay out all six of my shapes from here onto this piece of paper but at full size. If you look closely at the plans you'll see that the radius which is half the diameter of a circle going from the middle to the outside is three centimeters. Now if you only have a ruler in inches you can convert your sizes like that but we are going to take a compass with your pencil and set it up. Now right now you can see it's at roughly 4.5 centimeters. Let's get that closer to three. One, two, oh, we're close, a little bit more. One, two, three centimeters. Let's draw that circle. I always try to double my papers up. That's gonna give the point of this just a little bit more grip. Start by drawing your three centimeter radius circle. I'm gonna do it in the top corner. Make sure you have enough room to actually draw it. Make a nice little point, draw your circle. Once I have that circle drawn, I'm going to add the center one. That one has a radius of one centimeter. I can go ahead and make those changes on my compass. I want to see a one centimeter circle there. I now want to divide that into five equal sections. Let's start with that. I'm just going to sketch that out into roughly five sections that are somewhat equal. They don't have to be perfect because flowers are not completely symmetrical. I'm going to go ahead with my ruler and draw those in. Now it's important to know how to do these kind of things because you may not always have a printer or templates to copy from. So if we learn how to draw our own, that's a skill in itself. This shape is almost done. I'm gonna add the little curves that you see here on these other ones to this very easy like that. Let's add those in now. They don't have to be perfect. We're gonna be roughing them out and then we'll make it perfect when we cut it out of metal. But this is to make sure that we know roughly how much material we're gonna to need to use so we don't waste it. So this and this is now the exact same. Aside from this is now the proper scale, which is three centimeters radius. I'm gonna write that down so I don't forget which ones I'm doing. I'm gonna go ahead and just draw all the different circles that I'm gonna need, and we'll kind of do this in fast motion so you can see quickly how this happens. Okay, so I've got all those drawn out. I'm gonna go ahead and sketch in all the different shapes next, but I'm gonna save the sepal and this small little three petal radius for last. I'm gonna zoom in to do those because that's the ones that students tend to struggle with the most. 
I've got those shapes in there. All I have to do is add some curves to them, just like I did the other ones, and those will be finished. So that won't take too long. Now you might notice that not all of these are the exact same shape. That's okay. If you really want to take time to make it absolutely perfect, go right ahead. All of these are really just a set of guidelines for when we're going to be cutting them out. We can still make changes. You may have noticed I've just sketched this in. I've done a lot of these flowers, so I can kind of estimate roughly how much I need. This circle represents where we do not want to cut. We will be drilling a hole to put the stem through. Depending on the size of the material, you're either going to be using, in our class, 8th inch or 3 16th. But really, you're going to be drilling that hole to fit whatever metal you have for your stem. This piece here, the 4.2 centimeter radius, is going to end up looking like this one. That's the sepal. That's the bottom part of what we're going to be adding to our rose project. I'm going to divide it into five equal sections because this one has five different leaves sticking out of it. And we're just going to estimate that. Again, it doesn't have to be completely perfect. We're just trying to make them roughly that far apart. I'm going to go ahead and add lines in there with my ruler. Until I have my roughly five equal spaces, I understand that one of them is a little bit bigger than the other, but that's okay. Now, if that's the shape we're trying to get, it looks kind of like a starfish of some sort. This is actually going to be a lot easier than you think, trying to add in all those things. I'm not going to draw them in the middle here. I'm going to use these lines as my guide. So I'm just going to go ahead and add a little bit of a halfway point on my one centimeter radius circle. I'm going to take that and go up to the point here. Use a pencil so you can erase your mistakes. Or keep them. Happy accidents are all right sometimes. There we have a very simple shape, which mostly matches what we've done there, except a little bit bigger. So for this one here, that's going to be 2.7 centimeter radius. That's gonna be these here. This one looks like it has three things coming out of it. I'm gonna look at these in terms of three little circles on the outside. One in the middle, one, two, three circles on the outside. And then we're gonna fill in the shape. So I already have one circle there. If I can, I can kind of sketch out roughly where they're gonna be. And I'm just gonna make a rough circle here. They don't have to be completely perfect. I'm gonna add in the other lines as we go. If you want, you could use something to trace a circle. If you have some kind of template, some kind of round object that you can use, you can use that as well. You could use something like this to trace stuff. These are readily available at a lot of stores if you know where to look. You can find something like this at a store like Staples or find these online. This is just a large circle template by Rapid Design. I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to sketch them in. Once you have your three shapes here, you can kind of make it look like that. I'm going to join this together so it actually looks kind of like a fidget spinner. They don't have to be completely perfect. But if you can get roughly equal spacing, it'll make it look nicer when we do our final product. Okay, that's pretty much done. As long as I know roughly where my hole is going to go in the middle. Now that those are all drawn and you're happy with all of these, and if you're not happy, well then fix it. Simple, right? Once you've got all those done, go ahead and cut out your templates so we can get those ready to trace onto our material. One, two, three, four, five, six pieces. Now, if you already have just small pieces around, it's really easy to go in. Make sure you got enough material that you can fit everything on. I could do that out of these scraps right here. If you already have a large piece, then you need to cut it down a little bit. If you're a teacher doing this with your class, you probably have big sheets and a big foot shear. I'm going to go ahead and lay my templates out from biggest to smallest so I can figure out how much material I need to cut. A lot of times you would just cut right here. Well, that ends up wasting some. If I have a whole bunch of students doing this together, I'll do it like this, hold on an angle, and then for the next group of students, they're gonna do it opposite, and so on and so on. I've done my best to leave a little bit of space in between them so that I'm gonna be able to use snips in between and get in there really easily. You wanna make sure you set yourself up for success if you're doing this with a class. So here I can go set out another set right there. 
I'm going to go ahead and line that up in the foot shear. I'm going to line that up with the edge of the table. You can see there my scribe line is meeting with the edge of the table right there and the edge of the table right there. Once I've confirmed it's in the right place, I go ahead and use the foot shear to cut it off. Now there's a variety of ways to lay this out. Really as long as you got all your pieces on here, minimize your waste so you can reuse extra metal, we're good. I'm gonna leave enough space in between them that I'm gonna be able to get in there and do some cutting with a pair of snips. Now you could go ahead and glue these on or maybe you wanna be able to reuse these for multiple ones. You could use a scribe, trace them on. You could use a Sharpie. If you're gonna use that, I'm just gonna hold it down, get my rough edges here. And this is why it didn't matter if these are completely perfect. These are rough, but I wanna make sure that they're about the diameter that I'm going for. In this case, that's why I use the templates. Now, if I can't find the center of this, I might poke a hole through my paper so I can find where was the center of my object here. So mine's gonna be right there where I drill my hole. I could go ahead and try to trace on the rest of the leaves, or I could just, you know, do that. So I have all six of my pieces drawn on there with minimal wastage. You can use a Sharpie, Scribe. Let's go cut these out now. So some different tools that you can use for this. Snips for metal, aviation snips, whatever works for you. If you're using thicker material for this instead of this thin gauge, you might need an angle grinder to go cut it out. I've seen a couple videos where the entire project was made out of fairly thick sheet metal or even flat bar, depending on what you've got kicking around. Now, when cutting sheet metal, you really wanna make sure that you don't cut your fingers on the edges or any other parts of your body. I'm just gonna break it into six of my pieces here to allow for easier holding. Be aware that every time you cut, you can be making an extra sharp edge. So watch out for your fingers. Any extra pieces you have after, put it in the scrap pile or leftovers. We can always use small pieces of metal for other projects. When you're cutting out your pieces, you want to try and not cut smaller than that circle. So I'm going to be cutting around the outside, follow those lines and stop. You're going to need that to stay strong and intact. You can see there's a little bit of a sharp edge. I could file it for 10 minutes or I could do that. Rounded over those for the most part. There's a couple flat spots, but that's okay. What we're looking for is avoiding things like points. That's gonna take a little bit of filing to smooth it out. That way it looks nice and it doesn't have this cut line. We wanna give that a little bit more rounded. Now you might have a hard time getting into small spots like this with the snips. Sometimes you could actually even drill some holes or just take a whole bunch of little tiny cuts until you get there. We can smooth that out with a file. That's not a problem. Rough it out, get rid of some of that material and just keep snipping until you're down there. Now, this is where you don't have to follow the templates exactly. You just wanna make it look nice. If there's sharp edges, snip them off. So one of the abilities we try to teach students is how to judge your work and is it good enough? For me, I give them some basic guidelines. I want these rounded. I don't want to see flat spots, sharp edges. Do you have the ability to look at your own work and judge, is it good enough for showing to somebody else? Maybe for yourself, that's all you need. But if you're giving this as a gift or something like that, this is something where you want to take that extra pride. Make sure you fix those jagged edges and stuff like that.
Now that you've got those all cut out, we want to go over and file any edges that need it, whether it's with a big file, small file, sandpaper. Smooth everything over so that it feels nice. If your goal is to make friends in the shop, you probably want to be aware of the type of noise that you generate when filing stuff. If you're by yourself, you don't have to worry about it. But if people are near you, they don't always enjoy those kind of noises. You can go a little slower, or you could try draw filing this way when you need to. I say just wear earplugs. So once you have these all cut out, smoothed over, not too sharp so that you can't, you know, cut yourself or, you know, trim your hair or anything. Then you need to determine what kind of stemmer you're using, thin or thick. I'm using, going to be using 3 16th round steel for this. This is just the cheapest stuff that I can get at my local supplier. And I want to make sure that the hole that I drill in here is going to match this. I'm going to just quickly cut out the length of my stem. I'm going to be using 12 inches or 30 centimeters or basically the length of a ruler. I've got my piece in the vise. I'm going to go measure it out at 12 inches or 30 centimeters or the length of most of my rulers here. It doesn't actually have to be completely perfect. This is an art metal project. We are not doing crazy fabrication here. You could use a scribe, Sharpie, whatever it is you need to lay that out. And then make sure that wherever you're doing your cutting is close to the vise. If you're cutting too far out, it's going to wobble and make screechy noises. Use hacksaw, bolt cutters, zip disc, whatever you got. I'm going to use a hacksaw. Once you have your piece cut out, you got some sharp edges here after cutting. Smooth those out so that you don't cut your fingers open. You can either use something like a file, hold it in there, just round over your edges enough that they're not sharp anymore. You can feel free to round the whole thing over, it doesn't really matter. Or we can go to the bench grinder. First thing you should do when checking the bench grinder is make sure that the gap in between the wheel and the table is not bigger than about two millimeters or an eighth of an inch. You don't want any metal getting jammed down into there. If you have a problem with your machine, fix it. Always use tools that are in good working condition. So I'm just going to round this over, get rid of some of these sharp edges. Now that your piece is all smooth, let's head to the welding booth. Once you get in here, you're going to need a welding helmet, gloves, some sort of jacket to protect yourself from any sparks, and a pair of welding pliers as shown here. To set up the welder, we need to make sure that the gas is on, the machine is on, and we are going to set it to 16 and about 200 for the purpose of this project. I'm gonna use a Sharpie and I'm going to measure just about two centimeters from one end and make a little mark. This is where I'm gonna add a little weld bubble or tack here, move it here, move it here, move it here until I have a little donut going all the way around. I'm gonna use this magnet to hold things in place so that I don't have to accidentally weld my piece of metal to the table. Before I turn on my ventilation and actually do the welds, I usually have my wire snipped here, using the snips, to about one centimeter long from the tip. That's just gonna allow students to get in there really close, make the wire touch, and pull the trigger for about one second based on these settings. I'm gonna turn the lights down a little bit now. So here's what it looks like. I did a, a very small weld. I turned the piece a little bit, did another weld, turned it, did another little bit, turned it, turned it, turned it, to have a little bubble all the way around. It's okay if it's not beautiful, as long as it's big enough. You can take your metal out of the welding booth with some pliers, cool it down so it's okay to touch. Don't grab this side. All good. 
Take a look at your piece after and make sure that it's nice and smooth everywhere. Did any welding spatter get anywhere it wasn't supposed to? We have a little bump here, but oh no. Right here we have some weld spatter that happened. Use a file to get rid of that so you don't cut your finger open. To prepare your metal for drilling, we need to use a center punch to put a little dent in the metal to allow the drill bit to find a little spot to start so it doesn't wander around. This is just a good habit to get into with most things we do in the shop. Go ahead and grab your center punch and a hammer and pop those right in the middle as best you can. Now, not everybody has access to a drill press or any kind of special punches or anything. We're just going to use a hand drill for this with a 3 16th drill bit, which should match the diameter of our 3 16th inch metal. Now, holding it just like this and drilling can be potentially unsafe. There's a chance of that piece spinning around like a little helicopter blade and cutting your hands open. If you just let go, it spins out by itself. So to make it a little bit safer, we're going to clamp it down to a piece of wood. The wood is to prevent any holes from going into my metal workbench. The clamp is to prevent this from spinning while we're drilling. Don't forget your safety glasses. Go ahead and test that your stem fits in all the pieces. If you have one that it doesn't quite go in, we're going to grab the drill and ream the hole. From either side of the hole, you can stick it in and we're going to go in a little bit and then wiggle it around to kind of ream and make it a little bigger. Doesn't matter which side, just to make the hole big enough, this can now easily go through. We're going to go ahead and add some texture to these things. And I have a couple different tools that we can use for that. One of the methods that I like to use to give these a little bit of texture and shape is to get a piece of rubber underneath it small chisel and a hammer. I'm going to use these to create some lines here to give it a bit of a ripple effect. Now this is all personal preference how you end up bending these, but I'm going to show a couple different techniques that students have used before. This one I'm going to make a line down the middle. I'm going to flip it and put two more on either side of that line. That might look something like a line there, a line there, and a line there. Now, you may be able to see that it's starting to get a bit of a bend in it. It's not flat anymore, just a little curve. If I flip it over, I can go and hit it from the other side on those lines that I drew. The harder you hit on a piece of rubber, the more that this is going to absorb it and bend. You might want to go over them again if you have to. But that's just to add a little bit of a ripple. Some of the other ways you could do it is take your needle nose pliers and you could go ahead and maybe bend little parts of it in. You could take the edges and bend them outwards. And we can do this more later once it's starting to get together. But start to give it a little bit of texture so it starts to look a little bit different than it did when it started. Another technique you can use is to take a hammer, hold it in a vise with the peen side up. Make sure you're holding the hammer by the head, not by a handle, especially if it's fiberglass or wood. And I can go ahead and take the flat side of my other hammer sandwich these in between. And that's going to start to give it again a little bit of a bowl shape. You can find other all sorts of things to bang it around, whether it's round, square, triangular, I don't care, this is your project. You can design how you want this to go. Now I'm doing this all to the same pedal because really it doesn't matter how it is as long as there's some texture. When it's painted and all of these things are all stacked up together, a lot of those things are going to be hidden and all you're going to see is the edge where you have a little bit of that cool 3D looking shape because you've made bends. Another option is to use something like a Dremel or a rotary tool when you're doing this. I just have a very small rounded bit. Uh, I bought these in a bulk pack at Princess Auto in Canada for pretty cheap and they last pretty long as long as you don't abuse them. I could use this and maybe actually draw some different shapes in here. I'm going to draw some shapes that maybe you won't see when this whole thing's finished. Or maybe you will. Don't forget your safety glasses.
Now when these are all sandwiched together, you might only actually see some of that, but it does give it a kind of a cool texture. This can also be painted on later if you're not planning on doing uh, all the big dents and stuff. Again, watch out for those sharp edges. Don't cut yourself while you're working. So you can see that all this cool chiseling, this is just my pre preference for doing it, it's because it reflects light with all those nice cool little angles there. Uh, I'm gonna finish these up and then I'll show you your next steps. All right. Now all these pieces are eventually gonna fit together like this. The sepal is gonna go on the bottom facing down. I'm actually gonna curl it the other way because of the texture. You're gonna go from the biggest to the smallest and eventually try to stack them like that. I'm gonna squish them down a little bit more so we can stick them onto the stem. So the plan here is put your sepal on. I'm gonna have that facing and that way for when I bend it down, you can see those. The next biggest piece goes on. The next biggest piece goes on. The next biggest piece goes on. If you figured out the pattern, I'm not even gonna tell you the next two. And hopefully, there's a little bit of that stem material still left right there. Now, my goal with this, instead of adding a big weld bubble to it, is to use a ball peen hammer, smack the top of it a bunch of times like I would a rivet. If you're not sure what a rivet is, it's one of these. What I have in my hand here is a very small aluminum rivet. We have steel rivets, all sorts of types. They would normally go into things that we need a fastener for where we don't want welding. This is pretty old school. You can see the top of the rivet here in this little bottle opener and the bottom of the rivet, that shaft part, came through. We smacked it with a hammer a bunch of times to kind of peen and make it larger than the hole that it went in. We're gonna do that to the top of this so that eventually when we hit the top of this, it's gonna mushroom out and be bigger than this hole. You won't be able to take these pieces off. Now you can see that I've got the stem held in the vise here with that big lump just above. If I have it too high when I start doing this and I start hammering, this part down, this whole stem part is just gonna start to bend and you're gonna get a sad droopy flower. We don't want sad droopy flowers. That's what real flowers are for after a week. Now take care not to smash your fingers. That'd be bad, so just watch out. Use pliers or something to hold this whole thing together while you got your hand in there, whatever you like. I'm just gonna do that for a little bit, but we're gonna start hitting the top of this with the peen side or round side of the hammer. Now, it's okay if the whole thing wiggles a little bit after this. We just don't want them all to fall apart. Look at that. It doesn't even fall off. Now, I have a few sample ones of these that I usually show students to show kind of a nice arrangement of the way things go. I like to have the sepal hanging down. The other one's kind of slowly going out and then curved and stuff like that. But really this ends up being personal preference. Having that nice 3D shape sure looks more interesting than what you see here so far. Again, once you paint, that'll also help make it look nice. I'm gonna use needle nose pliers and a pair of linesman pliers to be doing this part. Using the needle nose pliers, I'm gonna start in the middle, that smallest one, and start bending them up. Now, this is why we had to make sure that we left that one centimeter circle in the middle of our templates so that as we're bending, we don't have uh, anything snap off if it's too thin or weak there. Once you've got those bent up a little bit, again, either use lineman pliers, needle nose, it's a little hard to do with your fingers. I like to grab those edges, bend them in a little bit to give them a little bit of a curl. So as you grab one, give it a little twist, Try to add a little bit of a curl to them. Adding a little bit of that. Then I'll use my pliers again, and I'm gonna start grabbing those edges and slowly trying to twist and bend them over. Now you may have done this previously during the other step, but this is just the order of operations that I usually go for for this project. If you need another set of pliers to hold it, then do that. There's always a way, and I bet you can figure out what works out best for you. Wow. 
It looks nice when they kind of overlap each other. Play with that and don't move to the outside ones until you're happy with the inside ones. It's a little harder to grab them afterwards. So all of our little texturing, it's still there, it's very subtle, and that's kind of what makes it a little bit neater. These, uh, these needle nose pliers have seen better days. If you're using thicker material, something like 16 gauge, you might need to torch this thing first to make it soft and then bend it up, or torch it well bending. This can be done in such a variety of metals, so it doesn't really matter. It's all about that end product and what you're happy with. Or also, what do you actually have in your shop to do these? Don't have a shop? Well, I'm sure you can do it at somebody's kitchen table, just don't do it when they're at home. There is no right or wrong way to do this, but making sure there's less flat spots does make it more visually appealing, at least to me. Now you might notice that these are really spinny. That's okay, when you go display it, are you really gonna be playing with it or just looking at it? It's gonna sit on a shelf somewhere, who knows, maybe you're gonna display it. Remember all those pieces that I scratched earlier? Can you see all of it? Nope, not unless you look really close. And when I paint it, that's all gonna be hidden, I hope. Now, while the paint's distracting right now, you can definitely see the reflections and different light coming because of all these different bends. It doesn't quite shine bright like a diamond, but it does reflect something. If you were to build and sell these, you definitely might have to find a more efficient way to do these faster. This is a nice slow paced project where you get to learn about all the different hand tools. You do a little bit of welding, do some cutting, do some painting, lots of different stuff involved with this one, which is great for the junior grades or anybody just looking to make a nice pretty project. Now, if it's getting too loose, you can always go ahead and do more. The last part is the sepal. I like to have this hanging down here a little bit. One, it hides the weld, and I think it just looks really pretty. I'm gonna bend them up, and then I'm gonna add a little bit of a curl to them. Now, right now, that's very geometric. It's just straight edges. I wanna get some curls and stuff going on on these. This is where you get a chance to really go ahead and shape it and move the little things that you like. Now, another thing you can do to add a little bit more life to this, instead of just having a perfectly straight stem, is to add a little bit of a bend in it. I have a bending jig that I made here out of some angle iron, a little bit of uh, hard steel here, and some pipe. I have a whole bunch of these in different shapes and sizes. This is about two inches. That's a 3-8 solid piece of steel. I can use this to add a little bit of a bend here and there to it if I want. Just a little bit of pulling. Maybe I can do this to make it a little bit irregular. And bend it against this blue pipe to add a little bit of bend to it. I don't like it to be perfectly straight. It's kind of neat seeing a little bit of curve to it. Now, some of you might be done. However, I want to add some either leaves or thorns, depending on what kind of flower you want this to look like. Roses have thorns, flowers have petals and leaves. Anyways, I'm gonna add a little two uh, things here. So I've got a little bit of 16 gauge metal. This welds really nicely to here. This one's been painted, so I'm, before I weld, I'm gonna have to sandblast that or get rid of the paint. But I'm gonna go ahead and just draw on some simple petals here. I wanna do something kinda like this. And this tool here is called the Beverly Shear. You put metal in, you pull down, and it cuts. Ours is a little bit old, but it still does the job. Don't stick your fingers in there. 
Let's rough these out and then I'm gonna use a file to finish them perfectly. Now, if you're not comfortable with your fingers that close, don't use this tool. Use a hacksaw to cut it out and then use a file. I'm being very careful. Famous last words. <laughs> That's too pointy for me. Much better. Now, these are roughed out. They're not perfect yet. Let's go make them amazing. Smooth out everything. Try to get rid of any flat spots. If you're doing these, if you're doing thorns, then maybe you want those pointy bits. Now, just for personal preference, I know I drew these on here. The middle line, I'm gonna do a bend and bend it up. These, I might take a hacksaw and actually put a couple little grooves in the outside, or I'll use a chisel and bang them in. Either way, I wanna see some texture or some sort of shape. I also don't really care if this looks like a real flower or not. It's gonna look pretty neat. I wanna bend it over a little bit so you can see I've put my line at the top of the vise. And I'm gonna make it not perfectly straight. I want a bit of a wave. That will give me something kind of like that. Cool little shapes there. I'm gonna do it again to this one. So all my main pieces are basically fabricated, but there's still some sharp edges. I'm gonna go ahead and file them. I'm gonna go and sand them. And then I'm just gonna clean the whole thing with a little bit of rubbing alcohol before I paint because there's a little bit of uh, stuff from the Sharpies and other stuff on there. I want the paint to stick to it nice. I usually close my eyes and rub my fingers over it. If I feel edges, that's where I wanna sand or file. Just enough that you can hold it without bleeding everywhere. Check that, is it fairly smooth? Can you smooth it over, do a little fast, sneaky draw filing? Pretty good. Hit it with your sandpaper for a couple minutes. You don't need to make it shiny, but I just wanna get it smooth to the touch. Unless you're going bare metal, then yeah, shine that thing like crazy. Now I'm gonna use the MIG welder again to attach these to here. Figure out where you want them to actually go in relation to maybe where your bends are and stuff like that. I want it to go something like this. Now I'm gonna hide the weld by doing this on the back. So I just wanna remember where that is. I'm gonna flip it over and I gotta figure out a way to hold this on the table without my fingers getting burnt. So the basic setup that I use is I use a magnet to hold the end of the stem. I have the main part of the flower hanging over the edge and I put these with the back side up, but slightly underneath there. So here you can see how the stem is over top. I'm gonna to hide my little tack welds behind. So you can see there, I just have a small tack weld to hold it together. Let's see what it looks like from the front. So there it is from the front. You can't see the welds, you see some burn marks, but gonna paint over all that. So now I have it outside and you can see the colors below on your screen that I'll be using. I'm gonna be using a little bit of John Deere green for the stem and these little leaves and a little bit of fire red by Tremclad on the bottom. I'm gonna start by over spraying a little bit of the green, flip it over after 30 minutes or whenever I decide to do my second or third or fourth, however many coats I do, mask this off and paint this red. Let's start with the green. A nice 
thin, thin coat. So after painting, here is our final product. The red turned out very nice, and as you can see, all the cool little bends in it reflect light in a very different and unique way. The petals, you can see those nice bends, those little cut marks from the hacksaw, give it a nice little jagged feature. And again, that is completely customized to how you want to build this thing. The welds are on the back, so you can't see them until you turn it. Those are nice and hidden and everything on here looks pretty good. The actual project itself fits nicely into a vase, vase, or however you want to say it, or if you've got a heavy duty pencil holder, you can drop them in there. At the time of filming this video, I currently have a group of students building their own. They are painting them in a variety of different colors depending on their personal preference. A lot of them are choosing to do the green and the red. Some have chosen to do more black or any other colors that they have. You can see that they've been using paper towel to mask while they're painting. So you made it to the end of the video. Awesome. I hope you are able to use this information to help build some projects of your own. These are great little projects uh, for art metal, whether this is for yourself, you're a teacher doing this with your kids. I hope this worked out for you. Price wise, these can work out to between maybe two and three dollars a piece to make, depending on where you source your materials. Where can you source your materials? Look around your personal hometown or wherever you live. Look for some steel suppliers, scrap yards. Sometimes you can reuse material that people are just throwing away. It really depends on where you are and how resourceful you can be. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave any comments below or questions. I will do my best to answer them. Please read the description down below and read other comments in case they have already answered your questions. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.